Lord, here we are, your students sitting at your feet. Teach us, speak to us, and then help us to obey. Give us the courage to do what you ask. Amen. Sermon on the Mount began with the Beatitudes. We started the first two weeks talking about the blessings, and and Jesus introduces us to the conditions and the dispositions uh, that he blesses. And he blesses those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the persecuted, those who have a disposition of hunger for righteousness, those who are merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. And the rest of the sermon kind of unpacks these as a commentary on these beatitudes. So today, for example, we're going to look at blessed are the peacemakers. And we're going to talk about what does it look like in an everyday life to live out peace with one another. Now, if we live this out, these conditions and dispositions, as Dave taught us, then Jesus says we will be the salt of the earth. We will be the light of the world. We will end up becoming blessings to the world. Then Jesus says something really interesting, and Dave taught this, that, that then we are invited to a new understanding of what it means to live in right relationship with God and with one another. And Jesus, the way Jesus said it is, it's beyond the righteousness of the Pharisees and the tax, or the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. I would say it's beyond whatever you consider, who, whomever you might consider to be the super righteous, the ultra right, the uber righteous in your life. Jesus would say, I have a different way of living. I want you to understand this. And it's going to have to do with this below the surface above the surface kind of life. You see, the life with Jesus exists in both realms, above the surface, but also invisible, what we can't see. And one without the other is out of balance. And that's what Jesus is going to try to teach us this morning. So, Matthew chapter 5, if you're there in your Bibles, look with me, starting with verse 21. And let me read Matthew 5, 21 to 26. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles. So Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, here we have the first of six examples that Jesus is going to give us of right living, living beyond the uber-righteous, beyond the Pharisees. And it begins with one of the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments was, thou shalt not murder. So Jesus says, you have heard it said long ago, don't murder. Now the Ten Commandments were the foundation of the Jewish law. So let's clarify the role of the law. The law, as written in the first five books of the Bible, uh, was built upon the Ten Commandments and was not given by God in a vacuum. In other words, God just didn't make up rules. And say, I think I want people not to kill each other. I think I want people not to steal from each other. No, the the law is rooted in a relationship with God that the Bible calls covenant. In fact, if you try to separate the two, it'll mess you up. You can't. The, The law flows out of the covenant relationship with God. Covenant is essentially God's commitment to us and and our response to Him. Covenant basically said this, God said to his people, and and we are now included in this, I will be your God, you will be my people. And the law then was an explanation of what it meant to live in relationship 
with God. For people, if you remember the story, the people of God had been living in slavery. They didn't know how to have a relationship with God. They'd been there for 400 years. They come out of slavery. God says, I'm your God. I want you to be my people. And he goes, so that you know how to have a relationship with me, let me, sh- let me give you the law. Let me help you understand what it means to live in right relationship with me and with one another. If you need a good example, a human example of this, think about marriage. Marriage is a covenant, uh, a human covenant. And if you, were, if, you're hap- if you happen to be married here or, or were married, you probably stood before a group of witnesses and maybe a pastor or a judge, and you made commitments to each other. You, you made promises, like, I promise to love, respect, cherish, honor, be faithful, share the remote, things like that. I didn't, that's not my vows, but, but, but you make those promises to one another, right, within the covenant of marriage. You don't separate them. You would never say to a stranger on the street, I promise to love, cherish, obey, respect. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. It, the, the, the promises only make sense in the covenant. Same with the law. The law makes sense inside the covenant that God makes with us, his people. So the law clearly said, and, and Jesus quotes one of the Ten Commandments, do not murder. And murder is certainly wrong. Right? Jesus didn't say murder's not wrong. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to show us the fullness of it, to fulfill it. So, so Jesus says, you've heard it said long ago in the Ten Commandments, murder is wrong. Do not murder. But if we only focus on the visible expression of murder, it's easy to justify ourselves. I would guess, I don't know, I would guess most of us have not murdered in this room. I would guess. I, maybe you have. God's grace is sufficient for all of our sins. But my guess is most of us murder. And so I would tend to go, ah, I've never broken, never broken that commandment. I'm good. Never murdered anyone. But Jesus wants us to understand the root beneath that command. He invites us to understand the, the spirit of that law. If you're harboring anger, toward another. Jesus says, you're also guilty of breaking God's shalom, God's perfect covenant, God's understanding of what it means to live in relationship with one another. So living in love relationship is so important, but but it's not just about not murdering. It's also about what is your heart attitude toward another. Now, let's talk about anger for a minute. Because I've had some interesting discussions about anger. Anger is often an involuntary emotion. And, and friends, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes anger is legitimate. There is such a thing as righteous anger. And we will get angry from time to time. Some situations call for anger. But there's a difference between getting angry and being angry. Okay, let me say that again. There's a difference between getting angry and being angry. Scripture teaches, in your anger, do not sin, implying that there are times that anger exists without sin. But but Scripture very quickly warns us that anger can quickly become sin if we hold on to it, right? Right? The writer of Ephesians, Paul says, don't even let the sun go down. You want to keep your anger from becoming sin? Deal with it immediately. Don't even wait a minute, a day. And then he says, get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander. Uh, the, The writer James says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So, anger happens. But what do we do with it? That's the issue. Do we justify it? Do we hold on to it? Or do we quickly resolve it? 
And Jesus is going to say in this section that we've just read, deal with it. Deal with it quickly. There are a, a, a variety of ways that anger becomes sin. Obviously, if your anger leads to murder, that's sin. I hope that doesn't surprise anyone. That's a problem. Anger also can lead to revenge. I just, this came across my Facebook feed this week, and I thought, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a story of a man who got his parking, lo- his parking spot stolen by a group of kids, and he went back and he slashed the tires of the car. And, and what I thought was really sad was it's on a page called the Awesome Video, the Awesome Videos page. In other words, revenge is celebrated. And we live in a culture in which revenge is celebrated. People laugh at it. They actually encourage you to take revenge. Revenge is too often celebrated as an appropriate response. It's a problem. But there are a couple other ways that anger becomes sin. One is if anger is is a, a habit in your life, if you have what the Bible calls fits of rage, if you blow up. If you, if, 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 you, if you can't control, if your anger, if your emotion of anger controls you, that's a problem. But there's a, there's a fourth way. There's another way that anger becomes a problem, and that is when anger is harbored in your heart, when anger is allowed to sit in your, your heart and just simmer, when you, when, you, when you grouse at someone, when you just are bitter, when you resent, and you have this this continual attitude of, of anger or resentment toward another person. Um, does anyone know what this is? If you can't see it, this is a, this is a bee smoker. Uh, I had to quickly explain to uh, the preaching team that no, you don't smoke bees like you smoke ribs, you know. Steiger said, how do you get the bees inside there to smoke them, and what do they taste like? No, you're missing the point. Missing the point. Kim and I have become amateur beekeepers. Here's a picture of Kim managing her bees. Isn't she adorable? So when you're working with bees, you you, you get yourself a bee smoker, and what you do is you put um, some fuel in, in here. We use like leaves and, and, and pine needles and uh, some gunny sack material, and you light it on fire, and it simmers in the bottom. It's sort of the, the, the embers sit there, and, and, and then the bellows, you squeeze the bellows, and it forces air into the bottom, brings the fire to life, and smoke comes out. And the, what the smoke does is when, ooh, there's actually still some smoke in there. Um, the smoke allows you, as you, as you put smoke into the beehive, it keeps the bees in the hive, it, it forces the bees back into the hive so that they're not flying out at you and you have greater safety and greater control over, over the beehive. I was thinking about that in terms of anger. Like sometimes anger just sits in our guts and it's simmering there like an ember, like a, like a spark. And, and we, can, we can feed that ember and bring that anger to life too often. When we see a person or when we think of a person and, or someone comes to our mind, we, we grouse or we get this spirit of, of resentment or frustration with them. That's a sign that the ember of anger is still burning in us and we've not allowed it to go out. We've not taken action. Now, one of the ways that Jesus says that we justify anger is by calling names. Jesus says, you know, whoever says to a brother or sister, raka, or uh, whoever says to someone, you fool, is also in danger of judgment. So, let's talk about calling names for a minute. I think name calling is one of the ways that we justify our anger. You see, we call someone a name, and what that does is that puts them in a category that's somehow below us. Now, you might have said, I've never called anybody rock off, and I don't ever call anybody fool. But Jesus, I don't think, was limiting names to just those two words. Rock off was a term of contempt for anyone. So, So we might say, you idiot, or you jerk, or you're stupid. Any name that you call that 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 put that demeans 
or belittles, we, what, what, we, what happens is this, is if I call you a name, I, I give myself the excuse to blame you for my anger. Because if you're really stupid, if I think you're an idiot, then I've given, then, then, then I have a justification for my anger. Because I've put you below me, I've demeaned you. When we call names, we, we, we are failing to see someone as a true person created in the image of God, deeply valued and loved by God as our equal, right? Here's what I think I said here. We justify our anger by creating this category. That person is stupid or they're dumb, and that devalues that person, and it gives us a sense of superiority and allows us to justify why we feel that way about them. I think we have to be very, very careful in our anger, in our feelings toward others, not to, to, to create categories or call names that give us a sense of superiority. So, what about our anger? Do we justify our anger by setting people in a category and saying, well, we're, we're justified in being angry because they are whatever, fill in the blank. Or do you neglect your anger by letting it just sit there and simmer? Now, what do we do? What do we do when our anger, when we recognize our anger? Well, Jesus says, handle it quickly, very quickly. The first illustration he gives, he says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Now think about this. This is public worship for their culture. It would be like Jesus were saying to us, So therefore, if you are, hear, if you are hearing a sermon, and there remember that someone has something, if you are singing a worship song, if you are in prayer, if you are giving your, alt, your, or your offering and remember that there's something between you and a brother or sister, stop. Jesus says, leave your altar. Now, worship is very important. Jesus knew that. He's not saying worship's unimportant. In fact, they would have considered this the most important act of their lives, as many of us do. This is so important when we gather as God's people to worship. But Jesus says, there's something that can hinder your worship. There's something even more important, and that is your relationship with one another. And if your relationship with one another is not right, deal with it. Take care of it immediately. Now, somebody in the preaching team said, what happens if people in the congregation, in the middle of the sermon, they get up and they start going to somebody else in the room to confess their sin and Ask for forgiveness. What do you do? I said, well, that would probably mean revival will break out. Because that's how revivals start, is when people begin to recognize their need and confess. Jesus says, even if you're in the middle of worship, don't neglect broken relationships with your brothers or sisters. Now, friends, this is hard. This is really hard. And it required, there's not, a, there's not an easy formula for this. There's not, there's not a, I mean, you have to trust the Spirit, understand the Spirit of what Jesus is saying and that relationships are so important. But often you have to trust the Spirit to help you with this. What does it mean? I, because I was, you know, because I was preparing this sermon, I think I was especially vulnerable this week to the Spirit of God, and, and I had the um, clear uh, encouragement from the Spirit to, to make a phone call this week and ask forgiveness from someone in the body of Christ. And you know, you know how easy it is to justify that broken relationship I immediately thought, oh, they probably didn't even think anything about it. Oh, you know, I'll probably see him soon. I'll probably see him on Sunday. Then I can deal with it. Oh, you know, they probably won't even, won't even remember what I said that might have offended them. But I kept feeling this nudge that 
Jesus is saying, whatever you do in the middle of even worship, go take care of it. And so, as hard as it is, as hard as it was, I did. And it's hard to reconcile quickly. Jesus, Jesus, and actually Scripture speaks so highly of our love for one another that, that Scripture says several times that if you're not right with one another, you can't even have a right relationship with God. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say, if you forgive other people, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive you. Ouch! I mean, that's harsh. It's in Matthew 6. 1 John 4 says, Whoever does not love their brother or sister cannot love God. God takes our love for one another very seriously. So let me ask you, is there someone, maybe they're in this room, maybe not, but it's a, but it's a brother or sister in the Lord, which is what Jesus is talking about here. And when you think of that person, it brings unresolved feelings of, of anger or discomfort or resentment. Is there someone to whom you need to initiate a conversation? Do you nurse feelings of animosity towards someone? Jesus says, deal with it quickly. Don't wait. Don't justify it. Don't neglect it. Respond. And then the second example he gives is for people who are outside of the faith. That's the last example in verse 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. So the first example was brothers and sisters within the family. But he says, even people who are outside the faith, if you've done something and they are responding in a way that, that is going to affect you, that they, you, you clearly have offended them, Jesus says, settle matters quickly. In both cases, inside the family and outside the family, there's something we need to do. And do it quickly. Second, I would say, after respond quickly, you take the initiative. Don't wait for them. We're, we're often like, ah, if they've got a problem with me, they'll come and address it. Jesus says, if your brother or sister has something against you, you go. Right? You've said something. You've done something. You go and say, look, I think there's something between us that we need to reconcile. I'm feeling like that it's not right between us. Now, I, we discussed this, you know, what are the limits of that? If, if, um, if you just don't like me, like if, if, you just, um, if, if you just have a problem with me, then, then you need to deal with that. That's between you and the Lord. Grow up. <laughs> right? But if there's been something between us, Right? If there's been something between us, if I've said something or done something or you've said something or done something or if you've said something to someone else, respond. I got, I got interesting how God does this. I got a, an apologetic email this week from a friend and we had been in conversation about someone else and what took the form of concern ended up, he felt, more like gossip. And so he sent me an email. Hey, look, look, I apologize. That, I really shouldn't have gone there in our conversation. That was inappropriate. And I, I appreciated that the Spirit nudged him and he, and he responded. He took the initiative. So don't think that it's just the other person's responsibility. Even if it's not your fault, respond. You be obedient. Approach the person first not the problem. Now, here's what I mean by that. In the, in, the, in the apology that I had to make this week, it was an apology, apology to someone with whom I will never resolve the problem, right? We disagree on something. 
And we have a difference of opinion, a difference of conviction, and the issue was not to try to resolve the problem. Because we have different convictions. We have different preferences. We have different uh, values among us. And so you're not always going to agree. Unity in the body of Christ isn't based on everyone agreeing. Unity is based on love. Love for one another, even in the midst of disagreement. So this person and I, we're going to live in a state of disagreement, hopefully understanding, learning from each other. But I was so tempted in my phone call, I was so tempted to get back into the argument, to get back into the the problem, and I kept having to tell myself, no, it's about the relationship. It's not about solving the problem. It's about the relationship. I just kept saying, I just want to make sure that we're okay. I just want to make sure that we're, we're loving one another, that we are reconciled. Let's, let's agree to disagree. Let's let the issue, the problem, not be the issue. Let's start with our relationship. You see, because we so often want to be right. We want to make a point, and we destroy relationships that way. Don't be so concerned about making a point, being right. It's not more important than love, than restoring the relationship. Next, I would say this, when you're in this conversation, this hard conversation, enter the pain of the broken relationship. I I was thinking about, we are not taught as children to apologize, right? Right? Remember, we're taught, your teacher says, say you're sorry, sorry, (laughs) right? I'm sorry. You're not. You're not entering the pain of that broken relationship, and when somebody comes to us to apologize, what do we often do? We blow it off. Ah, it's no big deal. You didn't even, I wasn't offended. You didn't even need to apologize. What I say is, on both sides, stop, pause, enter the pain of that broken relationship. When somebody comes to me, when I got the, the email from the, the, the friend who apologized, I was almost going to re- type back, eh, it's no big deal, but I had just been working on this, and I thought, you know what? I need to pause and and stop and, and realize what's going on in his heart and enter that pain. And so I, I said, hey, you know what? Thank you for having the courage to approach me and to apologize. Thank you. I know that was hard. And, and it is important that we reconcile, that we come together and, under, and, and love. So on either side, whether you're the one confessing or you're the one offering forgiveness, don't let it be superficial. Even if, it th- even if you think it is, don't. Take some time, enter the pain of that broken relationship. Because bottom line, God has come to restore shalom. Shalom means a right relationship with God, a right relationship with one another, a right, right relationship with creation, And that's what we do when we confess and when we offer forgiveness, is we're restoring shalom. Jesus says, don't murder, which on the outside is a way of preserving physical life. This commandment is based in the strong principle that every human being is created in the image of God. Every human being. Everyone is created in the image of God, and everyone has value to God. So the commandment was based on that value. Love one another. Love, preserve physical life. But that's rooted in a deeper understanding of wholeness, of peace, of being a peacemaker, of restoring shalom. We, uh, as a preaching team, let me give you just a glimpse into a conversation the preaching team has had. We, how did we get to the Sermon on the Mount? Why are we preaching through these three chapters in Matthew? We were talking about our culture. We were talking about our world. And we were talking about, you know, we're in, a, in, in, a, in an election season. 
in a, in a political climate that I would call toxic. Does Jesus have something to say about that? Absolutely. Does Jesus have a way of approaching relationships in a climate like this? Yes, he does. We talked about racial, the racial tension in our world, in our country, and the racial violence. Does Jesus have something to say about that? Absolutely. We talked about the violence in our world, around the globe. Does Jesus have something to say about that? And we felt convicted as a preaching team that we need to disciple our church, our church family, in the ways of Jesus, in the ways of responding to situations and responding to one another the way Jesus would respond. And we were drawn to the Sermon on the Mount because we see this, the, the, these three chapters as Jesus' way Jesus' revolutionary, countercultural way of responding to a world that is full of violence, full of hatred, full of vitriol. Jesus says there's a different way, there's a better way. And as my people, I invite you, I invite you into a different way. Will you respond? And the sermon's going to go on. We're going to keep talking about ways that we respond in this world. But to start with, if we don't have shalom, if we don't have shalom with our neighbor, if we don't have shalom with our Christian brother and sister, if we don't have shalom with the person we work with, we can never hope for shalom in our community and in our world. It starts right here. Will you let Jesus restore shalom? Pray with me. Has God brought someone to your mind this morning that you need to call? that you need to approach? Has he brought someone to your mind this morning that's a, maybe they're a Christian brother or sister and there's been, a, there's been something that's happened between you and there's a, there's a simmering spirit of resentment or anger or frustration. Hear the words of Jesus today. Resolve it quickly. You take the first step. Or is there someone outside the family of God, even in a community? And, and maybe they've felt offended by you. Or there, there's something between you. The Bible says, as far as it's possible with you, live at peace with one another. Take the, take the step. Lord Jesus, we've heard you speak. Now, help us to respond. Help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen.